Alrighty, hello every folks and good morning! Alright, it's time to talk about some uh, FFT uh, remake type of thoughts and things. Um, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, basically, all we know so far, uh, for those that uh, missed it previously, FFT Remake is more or less seemingly confirmed uh, to not have been one of the things that was uh, cancelled in the actual um, uh, kind of a mass, uh, mass extinction event uh, <laughs> that uh, Square Enix games were going through. And logically speaking, that makes sense. Uh, basically, it was never going to be the main thing that got cancelled because this thing has been, you know, largely requested for a really, really dang long time at this point. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, all we know so far is that it is something and it exists, okay? So we basically have nothing to go on, so if you're here for concrete details, uh, that's not what this discussion's about. I'm primarily going to be talking about uh, just kind of various game design details. So the thing is, um, I saw a lot of things pop up in the comments, and, you know, these are the usual stuff that uh, end up coming up. Uh, in terms of uh, comparing Tactics Ogre Reborn and whatever it is that uh, our um, uh, FFT remake ends up uh, shaking out into, and the thing is, all of this stuff is specifically in context. Uh, there's specifically always seems to be a lot of these comments and fears flying around over, you know, oh, it's going to specifically use this system, oh, no, it's going to be so simplified, all of these kinds of things. Um, but all of this is always going to depend on context. So, like, one of the things that came up was, uh, for example, when they remade Tactics Ogre Reborn, they gave it this card system, and many us immediately assumed that, oh no, it was an attempt to simplify the game. But this was one of those, uh, one of those situations where a mechanic was put in because it kind of needed some analog uh, for some of the stuff that didn't work. So, we're going to start off examining what happened with uh, Tactics Ogre Reborn, and then kind of use that as a little bit of a lens to go look at a uh, FFT remake through. Um, so let's go ahead and start off with those cards. Why were they in, uh, inserted into Tactics Ogre Reborn? Well, they weren't simply inserted. They were actually replacing another mechanic that was kind of busted from every direction. See, when Tactics Ogre PSP was released, it also had its own context of different features. Um, and this actually goes back specifically to FFT and the influences it had on the original Tactics Ogre back on the SNES. It is, like I said, a bit of a long story. Um, so effectively what happened was you had the SNES version and it didn't really have too much going on in terms of internal, well, it had a lot of internal mechanics, but in terms of the actual like character building and progression, it was mostly handled through stats and things. You know, you give somebody, uh, you give somebody the right class, they end up going and raising their stats up for that class. And that's mostly what they're getting. They're not really carrying much through between classes. Then FFT comes along and effectively is a sort of a more focused version of the uh, of the chaos route uh, from Tactics Ogre, uh, where it decides, okay, we're doing away with all the story decisions, we're going to pretend that they're still there, but we're totally doing away with those, and the focus is going to be on kind of experiencing the story through your custom team, and your custom team will be able to carry stuff between classes like, you know, Final Fantasy had been experimenting with for a decent minute. Um, so uh, they ended up combining all those ideas together, but when the Tactics Ogre uh, re first Tactics Ogre remake uh, came about, they wanted to bring some of that over, because, hell, people freaking loved it. But the thing was, Tactics Ogre was always more of a sort of uh, Dungeons & Dragons type experience, it was more of a tabletop type experience. The setting was more about, like, the soldiers and the war. It wasn't necessarily, like, here's the story you're experiencing, it's, here's this tragedy that everyone's having a shared experience with. <laughs> um, here's this, uh, you know, story where basically everyone is at best morally gray and just trying to survive and there's no like grand reveals or whatever else everyone's just doing what they think is their best route to get through so dramatic reveals aren't really part of the experience uh you know gigantic character moments uh, for that individual person are going to be sprinkled in there but they're not going to be necessarily like the entire full story so for example like Yunin, despite having a backstory in uh, in in terms of um, you know having committed a bunch of war crimes and stuff like that, is still just a generic dragoon uh, when you get him with stats that are slightly different to slightly sprinkle at his backstory, but he doesn't really end up getting anything in particular. So you end up kind of building his backstory through his character. It's why I specifically have a uh, uh, a guy that's uh, that's regretting his actions so hard that he's specifically trying to uh, to reset time uh, and support people uh, through, you know, through his weird wizard build over here. Um, the general idea is less about um, about giving p uh, people that individual class that will specifically show off all their personal elements, uh, but uh, it's more so 
Uh, more so a situation where everything is a bit more, I guess you could say, almost generic slash bland-ish by design. Uh, that whenever something does stick out, uh, it's much more noticeable in this context. Um, so those moments uh, where, for example, uh, a lot of important characters don't get a unique class, uh, but then let's say uh, you have somebody like uh, like Canopus over here that starts with what seems like a unique class until you realize that it isn't. That he seems very unique right from the get-go, but it's an important mechanical moment that he ends up not being a unique class. Um, that, uh, you know, he ends up uh, turning out to have basically the same potential as any other Hawkman, he just seems important to you at the time. And same thing with somebody like Azelston, who comes in with a unique class, and it's like, oh wow, it's only something he can do, and then you realize several other people can also become that class. Um, that the idea is this theme of togetherness, uh, that effectively everyone's just experiencing the story together, everyone's got some individual elements here and there, uh, but they're they're constantly trying to tell this story through lots of little uh, little kind of mundane things. And the mundanity is part of, like, kind of part and parcel with this whole Tactics Ogre experience, right? So when it comes to Final Fantasy Tactics, it's more about those big individual moments. So you'll have those those moments of big, unique classes that somebody gets to better emphasize their, you know, their personality and stuff like that. Um, so that's going to be... Um, I'm assuming that uh, when it comes to that, we'll definitely probably see more, uh, uh, more of those uh, unique class elements. But additionally... Um, I'm going to assume that we're we're not going to see anything similar to the card system. That's actually what I was originally getting to. Um, so just for the sake of context, why was there a card system added to Tactics Ogre Reborn? It's because when that uh, first remake came about, all of those uh, elements got expressed through a lot of skills that ranked up uh, and a lot of passives that you slotted into a, a skill list that was almost twice as long, which sounds like it would be a deeper system at first blush, but it was extremely like difficult to actually get into was the problem. Um, that it didn't have much flow to it at all. It was basically a complete brick wall when a lot of new players were first experiencing it. And many people would essentially play with all skills unlocked, infinite uh, skill points, things like that, because they didn't feel like grinding. Um, and that's basically what translated into the new skill system. Like, you get the skill, you just get the skill now. There's no grind required. Um, and when it came to those cards, they took the place of some of the passives. Because the passives were, again, a regular problem. And if you're thinking like, oh, you know, just improving passives, what, how much of a problem can that be? Um, it was a case where, depending on your situation, your passives could do anything from absolutely nothing to potentially making you one-shot stuff. And there was, by design, no real way to predict it. So, like, let's say, like, Unit A uh, over here, like, uh, Unit A over here had a bow and had strength in four, right? Um, and then they're attacking Unit B over here uh, that uh, that happened to, let's say, have, you know, no, uh, no fortify on them at all. They were also going for a strengthen build. Then it just came down to whoever shot first, because this bow in that version would have been scaling up extremely high and would probably just one-shot the guy. But if he has fortify, then suddenly it's almost no threat to him whatsoever. Um, but that's the thing. The two of them basically cancel each other out. There were a lot of passives that were just canceling each other out, and there was no way to know who was going to have an edge over who. And so what they decided was rather than have all of these weird passives that you'd have to dig through skill lists for uh, that uh, people couldn't figure out over a decade after the game's release, let's just go ahead and make it something a bit more understandable. You have a physical up card, you have a magical up card, people understand that that, that unit now has an advantage over another unit offensively. There are no cards for defense. Um, except for the ones that apply for skills. Um, these skills originally had to be ranked, which meant, uh, well, not Phalanx. Phalanx was always at 90% and was extremely broken. Uh, but for example, let's say we had something like uh, Meditate, uh, which did have, actually, right, you're not going to use Meditate. Who's got Meditate here? You've got Meditate. Originally would have had to be ranked up. So somebody would have to use this skill every single turn, ranking it up extremely slowly. Um, and in this case, literally all they have to do is go pick up a card. Uh, that's a... Uh, in the original context of everything, when they when they originally made the game, they were thinking they want characters to have advantages over each other in some situations. Um, they want to make sure that uh, death matters, because this is a game with permadeath. Same thing for Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, more on that in a moment, because I have a feeling they might potentially bring back uh, a mechanic that they actually used in Tactics Ogre PSP. Um, 
But uh, when it comes to all of this stuff, uh, like, for example, something like Meditate, nobody liked using that skill over and over and over, and so what they said was, okay, you just have certain skills that activate at the start of your turn, you pick up a card, you're 30% more likely to activate that skill. It basically keeps the effect of the really nice feeling low level balance that they had in the PSP version, while also allowing you to play at the level of the high level balance that very few players actually got to in that version. So essentially, the entire thing was developed with an understanding over what made the uh, the kind of low end good, what made the high end good, and what didn't work in between. And so those cards were just a simple way to get that uh, that same mentality across to new players. And Personally, as someone who's been trying to explain this game for people for a very long time, it is a brilliant way to translate that over, despite many, you know, uh, many folks insisting that no, 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 the grind was the, just the most immersive way to do it, um, there was a correct way to do it, and there's actually a, a few correct ways that the system was used, Tactics Ogre PSP was not it. Um, it was uh, definitely vastly improved in the One Vision overhaul, and there was actually one case uh, of a uh, of a game that I saw that uh, really really improved on the idea, uh, which was a a happy little game by the name of King's Vein, uh, which I'm assuming many have potentially not played yet. But here's the thing with King's Vein: um, it's uh, if you've ever heard of Horizon Skate, that's probably their their most popular game. Uh, think of it as what would happen as a sort of middle ground between if you took, like, FFT, like, in terms of its overall game feel and punchiness, uh, Tactics Ogre in terms of its scale, and then Ultima in terms of its world interactability. So you'd have things like, for example, a, you know, a soldier has the... One of your soldiers has the ability to throw out a chain, and so they use that chain to pull a piece of furniture to go block it off a doorway because you were suddenly getting uh, rushed by a bunch of units, um, and that suddenly became a massive problem for you, right? Um, and I would assume we might see some elements of something like that in FFT, and I hope we do. Uh, but more on that in a little bit of a moment. Uh, so I'm hoping that we see stuff like that. Um, if you wanted to see that skill system used correctly, again, the reason that that worked in King's Vein, though, was because there were not random battles until the very end of the game. Okay, so effectively, what happened in King's Vein uh, was that uh, they basically said, "Okay, you, um, uh, what you've got um, is a set amount of battles. You've got a certain amount of points that you can spend on things, and that is your total progression." Your incentive to keep on exploring is not overpowered items or the next plot event necessarily, um, but it could be as simple as getting more experience uh, to actually build out your characters more, because you had a very FFT-esque system in which you were expanding out your different units. Um, and so to that end, you had those moments where you would feel softlocked and then realized that there's literally no other way for you to build your units, so you better figure out a way to use what you've already got to go find more uh, more points to build your people up. And that felt really, really good. However, in that context, there was no permadeath. Now, that actually leads to the next interesting question. Will FFT potentially have permadeath? Again, more. let's just put a pin on that for the moment. But... Uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, in that case, uh, a skill system where you actually had to spend points to unlock skills made sense. In Tactics Ogre uh, Reborn's case, it did not make sense because those skill points were, again, something that was preventing people from going and exploring. Um, that Developers generally want people to actually go and explore these different uh, uh, kind of settings that they've put in place. And so just keeping the system because it's what was already there doesn't necessarily help. Like in FFT's case, what does the skill system give you? A reason to go revisit the planes over and over, and potentially hope that you don't get completely mobbed by uh, uh, by a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of uh, lions, right? So, not exactly an ideal situation. I, again, that's not to say that the grind can't be satisfying, but a lot of the FFT experience uh, from back in the day was simply a matter of okay, I've got this. Um, you know, I, I've, I've got this idea for a build in mind. Let's go ahead and grind up a, a, a class levels and skill points until we get there. Um, and again, the, the issue was that it started off with a grind and then typically didn't expand much once you finished building, right? Uh, you just sort of finished off your thing. There wasn't a reason to necessarily move stuff back and forth once you got your full team going. 
And to, it's where you oftentimes will see that sentiment that it's very interesting at the start um, and potentially, uh, you know, it potentially has some challenges here and there. But a lot of times, you know, it kind of feels like it plateaus out. So I would assume that they're probably going to handle something along those lines. And to that end, I think what they might do um, and a couple of things that I think they might bring back could potentially be from the Ogre series. Remember that these, uh, every version of, uh, of Final Fantasy Tactics, including the Advance games, um, including the uh, the various uh, uh, various uh, Tactics Ogre games and stuff like that, they tend to borrow ideas from each other a lot. And so what I would expect um, is that uh, they actually might go an interesting way with this. So, and please bear in mind that this uh, this does all tie together. I'm not just discussing completely random things here. Um, when it comes to the idea of permadeath, one of the problems uh, that, interestingly enough, uh, 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 Tactics Ogre PSP addressed that uh, it was kind of completely erased uh, in um, uh, in something like uh, like Reborn, but also could potentially be an interesting way to fix a different problem in uh, FFT, would be the idea of keeping your units alive after permadeath. See, the thing is, when a unit dies, they obviously they drop their crystal and stuff like that, right? Um, so you transfer all their skills over to somebody else, which is, again, that's fine if you have that character in the party. But the problem is you probably won't have their replacement sitting there in the party unless you happen to, let's say, have a uh, have an orator on the team. You've convinced somebody else to join the team and then suddenly, you know, you've recreated the old unit. So what Tactics Ogre PSP did was, interestingly enough, they borrowed that idea to some extent, um, but effectively what they said was, okay, you uh, in, instead of um, instead of just completely, you know, replacing uh, that unit right then and there, um, effectively, or rather, uh, instead of also having that awkward moment where you're not necessarily sure what's happening, um, instead what we're going to have is a situation where we have our... Um, uh, we, we have our uh, dead unit stay in the party, like they just stay there as a body, basically. Um, and you cart this body around, and what they do is that uh, you spend a, a silver coin to go transfer the kind of current progress, current locked-in progress of that character to another unit. And so, effectively what this means is that when a... Um, Oh, uh, when that uh, character ends up, let's say, uh, let's say they end up dying, right? Uh, then let's say they're ninety percent of the way through uh, uh, through a uh, level, then or uh, a skill rank, I should say. Um, then they would just kind of default to the lowest value of that skill rank, but they would keep like let's say whatever ranks they ended up building up up to that point. Um, so like let's say they were at uh, rank six at 90 percent they would just be at rank six at zero percent but they would bring all their skills over it was a way to prevent losing your progression um, while also keeping that idea of permadeath in play the problem was they also added a live system which completely threw any value of that particular mechanic out the window outside of cheesing it uh, <laughs> you could use it to for example hire a brand new named character instantly kill them um, and then go transfer for all their skills over to somebody else. For example, this ha ha uh, happened with uh, one of the hidden characters, where you had a, uh, a kind of plot-important character that you could uh, go back in time and save, um, and people would often kill that guy off in order to basically transfer his uh, uh, rank of parry over to, uh, to everybody else, because it was very tedious to raise. Um, you, you literally could beat the entire game and, uh, and go recruit this guy and kill him over and over, and it would be faster than getting those parry ranks yourself. Yes, it was that slow. Um, but the idea was that you have this mechanic wherein they, um, they go and they transfer a dead unit skills over to somebody else. Um, and this does work in the right context, uh, because, uh, for example, in, in uh, uh, Reborn's case here, everyone just gets their skills. You lose the unit, but you don't lose their kind of uh, overall functionality. You get the drama of losing the unit, um, but you don't get the tedium. Um, and there was a, uh, a there's a really, really uh, good overhaul that's uh, essentially completed, but still getting new features all the time, called One Vision, uh, for, uh, for Tactics Ogre that does make that kind of stick, uh, that units are way more likely to die in that one, uh, way more likely to... Uh, to kind of have a reason to be sacrificed and whatnot, uh, 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 getting units back up on their feet is a, a good bit more difficult. And the nice thing about this 
is that it creates this moment where you're uh, essentially transferring these old skills over to new units and just kind of creating a new story. You lose some of the stats that they gained along the way, but still the story continues. You haven't lost the kind of tactical functionality of the unit, um, but you have managed to get the drama of a loss on your team, which, again, Reborn, I feel, probably handled down in the best way, where you just immediately get your skills on a new character. Now, I don't think that they'll handle it that same way, but... What I do think they'll do, what I do think they'll do is actually kind of a cross between, and I, I hope that they do this, um, would be a thematically very appropriate thing of combining the stuff that they tried in Reborn and the stuff that they tried in Night of Lotus. Now, I expect many folks here will not have played Night of Lotus, and it's Lotus like the, the country in game here, L-O-D-I-S, not the flower. Um, but here's the thing, what they did uh, in Night of Lotus, uh, was that classes as well as, uh, as uh, certain perks were unlocked through what's known as the Emblem System. This has not been emulated in any game of this type since, and uh, to me, if they saved it for an FFT remake, like, that would be the, like, strategic wet dream right there. Now, the thing was, Night of Lotus was not a particularly long game, and it was uh, it was a game that uh, that was on the GBA, so it wasn't exactly going to uh, to make the biggest splash in the world. But the, the thing that made it significant was that this emblem system was perfect uh, for a game like this. The idea was that every time your character did something cool, they got an emblem for it. If you knew what you were doing, if you knew how to train someone. This meant that you could very quickly speedrun somebody to really solid status uh, without having to worry about grinding. That, honestly, you were better off forgetting that levels were even a thing, and then just giving somebody the emblems that they needed. Like, you could go and grind somebody for, you know, let's say five levels to go get them some additional agility, or you could have them take uh, uh, three consecutive shots with a, uh, with a bow and arrow in order to unlock the sniper emblem to get additional agility, then switch them over to the archer for additional agility training. Uh, or, for example, uh, let's say uh, one of the best ways to start a solo run in that game uh, was that you would take your main character and uh, get uh, have them get a counter-attack kill, uh, getting them self-preservation in the intro. Um, and then from there, you carry over that self-preservation to increase your, uh, your uh, counter-attack damage beyond your normal uh, kind of damage that you do. And then from that, you translate it over to the Fist Fight emblem for killing an em a unit while completely unarmed, giving you endgame uh, level damage on your fist, something that people usually wouldn't figure out until endgame. And then you combine that with, an, uh, with like, let's say, hiring a weak unit out of the shop, and you would take this fairy, you would give them an elemental disadvantage versus that unit. You would stand them on tiles that have elemental disadvantages uh, to boost this even further, give them a buff to boost this even further. Suddenly they can, like, punch one-shot somebody right out of the intro. Then that gives them War God. Uh, from there we get Berserk. Uh, you uh, take this over to the second uh, uh, second fight that you do. Uh, you solo the map. You get Mark of the Elite. You get Centurion. Like the uh, th that progression would feel incredible for an FFT remake. And considering the uh, the overall way that they like to that they seem to be leaning here, it's not towards simplifying. It's towards essentially giving you improved game feel. Now imagine you've got your FFT experience, right? Instead of grinding, uh, instead of grinding specifically for levels or whatever else, let's say you get all of these little mini achievements uh, that, you're, that you've got scattered throughout all of your different classes, right? Uh, every one of them's got some different cool thing that they can do, and they unlock their skills through these little mini achievements. Like, uh, in, when they, uh, when they, for example, show that intro, uh, uh with, uh, with Balbanes and all that, uh, or whatever they decide to rename him this time, um, when they're talking about how he earned those things, he could potentially be showing, you know, little hints over how the, how the, uh, you know, Holy Sword or whatever they decide to call it this time, uh, ends up unlocking their different skills or whatnot, you know? Like, showing them getting specific kills. Um, like, for example, like, let's say a character could potentially unlock it by getting a magic kill and a melee kill uh, on the same turn somehow. Or, you know, it, let's say they, you know, they hit something with lightning and then they counterattack kill somebody or something. Because that existed in Night of Lotus. Uh, that was uh, the, the pen and the sword. Um, so that kind of stuff, I feel, could work really, really well. Um, because they seem to, to like that idea of building up your units through their kind of experience through their personal stories and whatnot, um, and in that particular case, I feel like it would end up working pretty darn perfectly, you know? Um, like, let's say you take a squire, and let's say you have them throw a rock, and they end up killing somebody with that throwing rock. Okay, cool. Archer unlocked immediately. Uh, let's say you, um, 
uh, you have a, a unit uh, uh, block multiple attacks in the row, again, exact same way Knight of Lotus did this, immediately get access to Knight, uh, get access to, to that uh, to that parry and the improved shield blocks and stuff like that. Um, like that feels like it would be a really cool way to handle it, you know? Um, it would allow for quicker progression, it would allow for still keeping a significance in those units, it would allow for not necessarily uh, locking things behind skill points unless you're awarding those skill points for things like side quests, you know? Um, now, as far as the card system, I want to point out again, I don't think that they would put anything like this because this card system in Tactics Ogre Reborn was specifically only there uh, in context to what they messed up in PSP with all of those passives. So effectively, that is not a thing for FFT. They're already doing fine. The main passives that would actually uh, essentially have a similar thing in that case would be like your attack ups, your magic attacks up, ups, and that kind of thing. And those would still obviously require the sacrifice of a slot to actually uh, uh, do anything. Um, I personally think that all of those kinds of things just need to be moved over to equipment, but either way, they seem to have a good track record of knowing how to make game feel work, so I would definitely say that they'll probably uh, have a solid way of doing it. Um, but to my mind, that emblem system, that would be, like, that would fit so well in FFT. Um, and they seemingly tried to do something kind of similar-ish uh, with the Tactics Advance games. Now, again, I say similar-ish. It's not exactly the same thing, but they also tried to get you to try different equipment and try different builds and whatever else because skills were unlocked behind essentially training with a particular piece of equipment um, that, uh, you know, every blue mage had to start off with their vest and their basic saber, um, but then would train in a completely different way, that they would learn how to learn their skills and then they would switch over to another class. And that felt good, but a lot of people got mad because it wasn't necessarily intuitive and that emblem system is beautifully intuitive and it was barely explored in the game that tried it um and it again it just feels like an idea that would be perfectly reserved for something like fft like if you gave and and uh, this is actually something that um <sighs> that funnily enough again they tried in knight of lotus to some degree where like let's say something like the arbitration emblem right where every unit has a chance to go recruit somebody else but those odds are extremely low. Like, typically you're talking about 3 to 4% for somebody to talk down an injured unit, right? And so they have the ability to do it, they're just very unlikely to have it succeed. But uh, at the same time, if you get somebody the Arbitration Emblem, something that your main character can actually start with in character creation, um, they're able to essentially talk down units with up to, like, 50% odds, right? Um, that oftentimes they're, they're better off literally just talking to people than fighting them. Um, but then they also had another system in there in which certain classes would just respect other classes. So, like, let's say you were trying to negotiate with a basic foot soldier, if you sent your knight in because of them being essentially the same thing but a higher rank, uh, they respected them. If you, for example, had all of your, uh, uh, you know, your uh, sword masters and stuff like that uh, with all their, like, Casanova-looking situation, they they did better talking to the ladies. Uh, or on the flip side, you had the Florida Witch go in, they were more likely to, uh, to have success uh, talking with the dudes. Um, there were a lot of little interactions like this that, again, I feel could work really well in FFT. Um, you know, uh, knights uh, potentially having those better chances to talk to squires, uh, maybe uh, uh, wizards and clerics not necessarily getting along, um, but like, or, you know, black mages and all that. Uh, but let's say, you know, somebody's, uh, somebody's more of a, uh, a geomancer or something like that, you know, they've sort of gotten to be a bit more one with nature or whatever. Maybe they're a bit more peaceful, maybe they're good at talking to the other mage classes, getting them to agree. Uh, well, at the same time, let's say, uh, you know, somebody like the chemist might be everybody's friend because they're the doctor, you know? Um, so, personally, to my mind, that I could see something like that happening very easily, just because we've never seen that mechanic come back. Hell, we've we've even seen that Knight of Lotus is regularly tested for things like, you know, Switch's uh, emulation thing, and yet it never comes back. It's weird that it comes up in little ways and then just disappears again. It's the strangest thing. It's one of my favorite games growing up. Um, so when, for example, a lot of things that feel very similar to it came out in Tactics Ogre Reborn, and I'm just like, where the hell's the emblem system? Like, they took a lot of visual cues from it. Uh, they changed some equipment to work like it. Um, they had a lot of maps that feel very similar to it. It's like, but where's my Knight of Lotus, though? <laughs> I could absolutely see that being reserved as a, look, this was a really cool idea, we need to bring this back, uh, we need to save this for the FFT remake. 
I really, really, really hope that that's what they end up doing. Um, I, again, we have no info to go in at this point, but I kept thinking last night, as soon as I heard the news, like, good God, that emblem system, that would be amazing. That would fit so well in an FFD context, and I'm sure somewhere... Uh, there must be some modder that at least gave it a shot, you know? Like, sh with all of the very many mods that are out there for this game, surely at some point somebody gave it a shot. Um, but so far, so far not really much in terms of news there. Um, so yeah, I, I would not expect automatic skills for something like FFT. I would expect that they may include something like the action system from, uh, from Tor, though. Uh, where, for those unfamiliar, uh, basically the action system is stuff like, uh, like your Mighty Strikes or Tremendous Shots or whatever else. Just activatable bonus skills that will extend, uh, how long it takes for your turn to actually take. Um, but, uh, the, uh, you can choose to use them whenever you'd like. Um, in fact, all the skills that are automatic skills, uh, in, uh, in Tor here used to be action skills, but due to the fact that action skills were put in the way that they were, this meant that you can now use multiple skills at once, stack those skills on top of another. It added a whole lot of uh, functionality while vastly decreasing the uh, uh, kind of complications of actually using them and stuff like that. Um, like before, you literally could only ever have one active, you could uh, you could only uh, use them as far as your rank could take you, your odds of success were often as low as 30% for stuff that you were getting in endgame, um, and Again, everything that Tor did, all of the stuff that uh, you occasionally see some very, very foamy mouths yelling about, was there for a very good reason, because it's one of those games that's misremembered a ton. Now, in FFT's case, it's gotten a lot more popularity over the years, it's de generally been documented and explored and tested and stuff like that a lot more, so there's a lot more people out there to basically say, hey, look, no, stupid, the mechanic was changed for a good reason, stop running your mouth on stuff you don't understand. <laughs> um, so, there was, uh, oh man, that feels a bit too harsh, but you know what? You, when you see some of the Steam reviews, hopefully you get it. Um, but a anyway, so as far as all that stuff goes, um, for for FFT's case, I would imagine that we'll probably see a lot more use of uh, of the debuffs that they didn't really do much with. Um, like for me, it was personally a really mind blowing moment when somebody pointed out like. Did you realize you haven't used oil since, like, Chapter 1 for basically anything? Like, oh. You know, that's interesting that they have this whole mechanic that works really interestingly and they'd never use for anything. Um, I mean, the, the bomb units, sure, but, it, you know, also kind of not really. A anyway, anyway. So, uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and get back to it real quick here. So... All right. As far as those, um, as far as other changes that could potentially happen, I have a feeling, uh, given that uh, that it's really solid for game feel and would also solve a problem in FFT, maybe we'll see again something like a, like a Ogre's uh, weight system coming into play. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I do know that it has again been extensively tested in something like the One Vision overhaul. Um, which again, I know I keep referencing something that many have not played, but. The thing is, um, it's uh, it's it's an overhaul uh, a mod that effectively uh, brought in a lot of mechanics from a lot of Matsuno games and whatnot. And so, in its case, uh, what we have is a mechanic in which um, we have we constantly have weight on equipment. So, like they brought in the health bonuses uh, and stuff like that uh, from FFT. Uh, based on equipment weight, uh, but then we had stuff like the damage threshold system from Tactics Ogre, and then we also had. Um, uh, had a weight system, because there's a lot of simulation aspects that go into this one, right? Um, and so, for example, like, you know, the heavier equipment somebody had, the more uh, it would delay them for their next turn. So that would be that uh, weight score that you see on the top right. Um, and so this meant that a lot of high-end equipment was pretty darn expensive. Now, uh, back in uh, in the PSP version of this game, they took it a bit too far, so there was a bit of a uh, weight creep uh, where you wouldn't want to use a lot of endgame weapons, because, comparatively speaking, it was just stupidly heavy. Um, but then, you know, they ended up uh, kind of evening it out and making it work in Tor's case. Now, for FFT, I would imagine maybe we'll see something similar. Because uh, one of the issues was that you pretty much always would want to go for heavy armor, if you could, for most units, just because, like, you know, stuff gave a ton of health and you didn't really have defense going on. I don't imagine that they'll include a defense system, because that did wonders for letting the AI do what, you know, what it does. Um, that it's uh, given credit as being this crazy uh, smart AI, um, when it basically just has a lot less numbers to think about than many other games, which does work for, you know, letting it make smarter decisions and such. Um, 
anyway. So in that particular case, uh, what uh, what we can potentially end up seeing is maybe you know maybe we'll see equip uh, weight tied to equipment and stuff like that, um, in order to maybe maybe uh, kind of uh, uh, balance out turns a little bit more. So like in FFT's speed system, what they did uh, was that you had obviously your speed score, but additionally uh, you were kind of uh, penalized uh, on your movements uh, based on whether you moved and uh, whether you acted. And if you did neither, you got a bunch of speed bonuses. Now that works in and of itself. Um, in TO's case, they went a little bit more advanced with it, uh, where the weight of your equipment, uh, the uh, exact uh, cost of firing, at, you know, using any individual weapon or skill or whatever else. Uh, was always a factor, and this actually led to a lot of fun interactions, especially, again, going back to those automatic skills I was talking about. Because now, uh, one of those things that uh, that was potentially an issue back in its PSP version uh, was that you would, for example, use use a potentially very expensive skill uh, that uh, that inflicted a debuff, and you would vastly slow yourself down. Now, all of those were effectively just kind of like auras, right? Uh, so, for example, let's say uh, stuff like uh, you see that uh, 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 girl dressed in black there. Uh, her whole deal is that at the start of her turn, um, like I gave her e equipment, uh, the turns are invisible, but at the start of her turn, uh, she can potentially throw out uh, up to four debuffs on units nearby her, and that can cause a ton of chaos. Now, something like that would basically break the small unit limit in uh, in FFT in half. Um, I wouldn't assume that they would change the uh, the unit limit much. Uh, it is kind of iconic to the thing, and it is supposed to be Ramza and his squad just kind of going around, you know, doing just small hits here and there. So they're not me necessarily meant to be representing a standing army like these guys are. So I don't think we'll see a 100 unit uh, limit. I don't think we'll see a uh, party size increase, but I think... Uh, we will potentially see more interactions there in terms of uh, in terms of speed and everything else. So every tile, for example, in uh, in Tor's case, every tile that you move is calculated for how you know how fast your next turn comes. I could absolutely see them bringing that in because it does help a lot in terms of evening out the turns. Uh, that uh, taking a long movement is potentially going to put a unit in a place of getting an absolute beatdown. So that is, I, I could definitely see that uh, potentially translating. Um, in terms of, let's say, uh, stuff like the automatic stuff, I don't see that happening, but I would see something like them uh, putting in uh, the action system, where, let's say, you can maybe activate more skills during your turn, but it would vastly slow you down. It does seem to make sense that they would lean into the skill system there. Um, and additionally, it might uh, mean that, uh, for example, a lot of your uh, uh, Zodiac bosses and stuff like that could potentially uh, see their kind of massive dump skills translated into multiple different actions, essentially allowing them to sort of piecemeal out their skills uh, in different ways over the course of their turn. So, for example, say you've made your entire party immune to poison, maybe he just simply wouldn't use the poison element of his attack, but might attempt to go use uh, one, like the, the Doom effect uh, a couple of times instead. Um, something like that could potentially work, and maybe they might even lean into one of the things that they tried on the FFT sequel that few people have played, Vagrant Story, uh, where they actually had a very similar system in which you could, in theory, act an infinite number of times during your turn, but if you screwed up a button input, um, well, all of that accumulated risk uh, now suddenly will come into play. So what they did in Vagrant Story uh, was that they um, they basically said that uh, you like as soon as you attack a unit you can do an infinite combo right uh, you can pause at any time cast whatever you'd like whatever else as long as you have the resources for it um, and additionally there was a uh, kind of limb breaking system but I don't think they'll bring in anything like that um, but. Uh, essentially, what happened there uh, was that uh, while you could act uh, near infinitely, the more that you acted, the more you built up risk. Risk would increase your damage, increase your healing, and vastly multiply the damage that you are personally taking. Now, to an expert player, this is basically just like free insta-kill damage all the time. Uh, the speed run to that game basically involves uh, running max risk a huge amount of the time, because effectively, if you uh, t like, if you parry things correctly, because you can basically like, literally parry anything, um, you can uh, wind your uh, wind up in a situation where you are basically telling the game, okay, you know, I've taken X amount of damage, but it's okay. I've absorbed some of that damage, so my health is above zero as soon as my turn resolves. So <laughs> you can effectively run at negative health for part of your turn, and 
essentially uh, playing like that was incredibly fun. That uh, risk system um, led to a lot of very interesting strategic moments, and I absolutely could see uh, them going and attempting to put a system like that in, uh, that we use a sort of combination of the old FFT skills, maybe piece out some of the ones that did multiple things at once, but then also give you a choice over how many you could potentially throw out at any given time, potentially debuffing yourself in the process, you know? Um, so there's lots of potential there as far as I see it, uh, where maybe we'd see something like that emblem system put in to, uh, to make uh, class unlocks and skill unlocks a bit more of a skill thing. Uh, maybe we'd see more of these uh, situations where... Um, uh, where, you know, weight and choice uh, matter a lot more on your, on your individual turn, that it's not simply act or don't act. Uh, we add the complexity of, you know, weight and speed and physics to all of it, because if FFT was ever, like, really, really good at achieving something, it was making stuff feel punchy. And if you could take that up to 11 by adding more mechanics behind it, that would feel incredible. Um, and one thing that I really hope that they fix, please, oh, please, oh, please, I know that they're probably remaking it, God, I hope they're remaking... Like, if they're giving it a full remake, like, if they're giving it the remaster treatment, I hope they use the PS1 version and then just kind of take the uh, the War of the... Uh, or uh, the Lion War approach. Um, I'm talking about the mod, not not War of the Lions. There's a mod called the Lion War uh, that basically takes the PS1 version and gives it the features of the PSP version and doesn't do that stupid stuff to the audio. Because the original version had incredible audio. Like, it had some of the most solid sound design in a game I've seen full stop, right? Um, the the absolute punchiness of the moves. Like, you, when you got into, for example, that, uh, that uh, first WeGraph cutscene, like, dude, that hits different. Uh, like, I, that's one of those ones that was always memorable to me, because it's like, you can feel every punch. You can feel uh, it, when the rain's coming down. You can feel that. Um, and that's one of the things I loved about uh, when they did uh, tour here as well, that uh, when they redid the uh, uh, the weather effects and stuff like that, that you could literally just have the weather effects on and turn off the music and everything else. It's like, man, this whew, that's uh, that's some solid, uh, solid ass weather design. Um, anyway, so as far as all that goes, I would definitely assume that they're going to do some, do a lot of work to that audio. I would assume that they're probably probably going to go the the same route as they did tour in terms of uh, giving the uh, giving a voice acting um as much as you know war of the lines may have added some stuff personally obviously this is going to be up to interpretation um i know that uh that masuno himself said that he liked the uh, the translation in war of the lines um i know to me personally it like it just it sounded way too I always described it as kind of Shakespeare-ish, but let's just say that, uh, okay, they changed one of the, cool, like, one of the coolest lines in the game is probably the best example, uh, where in the remake they were saying, uh, you know, I don't, uh, let's see, it's, uh, it's, uh, fate or, uh, f let's see, was it, uh, f it was like, it was like a fate or, uh, or station that wronged you, not me. Um, and the original line was blame yourself or God. Like, dude, that line kicks ass. How are you going to replace that? Um, so for one thing, I'm assuming that line's going to come back because we have seen it referenced in every Tactics Ogre remake since then. Um, but like literally one of the death quotes for any generic soldier is I blame myself and God. Um, but, uh, but no, as far as the overall lines go, if they do full voice acting for all of it, I would assume it would be a bit more consistent. Um, one of the issues, with, at least in my opinion, for uh, War of the Lions there uh, was that it seemed a little jarring to have these really punchy cutscenes, uh, you know, when you're in engine, and then you get into the animated ones, and you're like, oh, I'm so posh and noble now! Like, he was, like, beating somebody to death with a battle axe a second ago. Um, now he's gone from Viking to, uh, <laughs> to just uh, being, you know, ultimate soft-boiled good boy all of a sudden. Um, I don't know, that always really just... It, it really did not work for me personally, but again, some people like it, so to each their own. Um, anyway, though, uh, so personally, I would assume that there would be a bit more consistency with them potentially redoing it from top to bottom. They said remastered, but they also, back in the day, said that TOR was a remaster. 
this was a total remake. Uh, despite using the same engine, despite using many of the same skills and whatever else, despite basically being a retool of the PSP version, there was so much stuff that changed that it was, for all intents and purposes, you know, a full-on remake. Um, and actually, one more thing I want to bring up here. Um, hopefully this is late enough that uh, most of the folks that don't actually listen to these but leave hot take comments and leave um, will not have listened this far. Um, for any of those that have made it this far, take a quick look at this thing. Because there were a lot of people insisting that it was like, oh, it was just AI upscaling. Oh my god, lazy cash grab. Um, this was another case that was basically a one-off with Tor because it was not AI upscaling. Basically, uh, the reason that that uh, got thrown out there was because the uh, the way that units look smoother looks somewhat similar uh, to one of the default effects from the PPS's PP emulator. Now, let me explain something real quick. Um, in the case of, uh, of Tor here, uh, it effectively was locked into using the same kind of hardware parts, or I guess you could say just like engine, game, whatever else. It is the original PSP game at heart, basically retooled, like, you know, stuff ripped out, other stuff put in. Um, it effectively is an, I would say, internal remake uh, of the PSP version, uh, where it's still basically, technically, on some level, using the original assets in different ways and then retooling stuff to make it all fit, right? It was a very unique situation because in this game's case, it was extraordinarily expansive, more than many play people that have even played it realize, uh, given that the story, for example, is not simply one like one playthrough worth of length. Um, that effectively the story itself has, sure, three main routes that it can potentially play out in um, that drastically change things, but additionally will have different variations based on, like, a absolutely ridiculous amount of, uh, of things throughout all of it. Um, even just about any character can live or die, and every cutscene has to have the ability to adjust for it, um, and the information they would have shared has to adjust for it, um, and potentially uh, entire scenes just simply can't happen or now play out differently or now play out in a different order or what have you based off that particular context. So FFT does not have that. Um, that they can actually rebuild it from the top uh, from the top down um, without needing to try and preserve some of the original because it would have been too large of a scope to build this one from scratch. Um, bear in mind that uh, I think the original PSP game, if numbers are to be believed, uh, took them about, uh, it was like 13, I think it was uh, 13 or 14 million for a PSP game. And the estimates that I've seen for this remake that they were given to make it work was about half a million. So if you're working with 1 26th of your original budget um, and you got to make it work, then yeah, you use as much of the original assets as you can. And what they did was they, when they were moving stuff to a new resolution, because the PSP had a unique resolution, uh, there's people to this day that complain even that its official sequel, the PlayStation Vita, technically doesn't uh, use the same exact resolution as the PSP does. Um, basically, that... Uh, the distortion that could potentially happen from just simply upscaling stuff would make it untenable. Um, it's, for example, if you ever want to see this, go and try on different effects on PPSS PP playing the original Tactics Ogre PSP, right? Uh, enough P's there for you? Fantastic. Anyway, the reason why it ends up resulting in so many weird things is because it's just layers of different uh, bits and pieces that are all doing different things. The background is different from the sprites. The sprites are different, potentially, uh, from the uh, the weapons that they're using, different uh, from the interactable elements on the map, different from the effects that are taking place, different from the UI that's taking place. Um, but they, it was basically trying to do something similar uh, in... Uh, like, you may notice that this looks really darn pretty for what was, what was originally a PSP game. Um, it's kind of a similar effect to what they did with, uh, like, uh, Resident Evil and stuff like that, like the Resident Evil remake, uh, which looked ridiculously pretty for a GameCube game, because, again, certain stuff was baked into the background, certain stuff was active in the foreground, and so due to all of these different layers of different illusions, as well as uh, using a proprietary screen size that nobody else uses... Um, it had to retool a bunch of different stuff. And so, for example, what they did with these sprites is that they had to stretch them out, but they still had to use the original ones because they couldn't retool all of the different animations and stuff like that for, again, the insane amount of classes that this game has. Uh, 
to just be something completely different. So they still had to reuse the original stuff and make it work. So they basically had to take those original sprites, add additional details, uh, smooth out the edges, but they also had to have a little bit of uh, kind of fuzz around the edges to not look like nonsense next to uh, uh, next to the actual backgrounds. Um, and again, just see the old, like, you improve the graphics on Resident Evil Remake, why does it look so weird kind of situation, um, where in this case it was specifically made to be looked at in a certain way, so it has to roughly approximate what those visuals were like, you know? Um, which, yeah, obviously is a bit of a mouthful to try and explain on the fly, but the general idea that I'm trying to get across here, Tactics Ogre was a unique situation. I... When it came to quote unquote AI upscaling garbage, blah, 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 um, it literally was a case where it was not AI upscaling. We already know for based on how many little details were added all throughout it, um, that it was intentionally done the way it was done because it was the only way to really make it work. Um, where they had to keep the original sprites, they had to make them look better, they added additional details, they still had to keep an additional fuzz, there were modders that tested uh, removing that kind of fuzzy edge from the units, and they looked like garbage. <laughs> so, due to the fact that it was on a bigger screen, it was the only way to make those sprites still work. So, I would not expect uh, that they're just going to keep the original stuff and scale it up. But, we actually have seen that happen for War of the Lines in particular, uh, specifically in the uh, the mobile and uh, iPad versions. Um, they actually added a full 3D effect, so you can fully, like, 3D pan the camera and stuff like that. It looks super weird. Honestly, it's just kind of a, a bit, bit of an extra feature, because uh, I know I personally just kept putting it back to the default one, because, man, it, uh, whew, it looked gross. Um, but... Um, yeah, when, when it came to, uh, to that game in particular, uh, they did redo the sprites, and then they also didn't quite redo the backgrounds, and it just looks a little jarring to see the two next to each other. I mean, for folks that want that, uh, you know, that perfect thing of, you know, trying to sharpen up everything exactly and try to give yourself the full 3D view, go try the phone version of War of the Lions. That's more or less what ends up shaking out of that particular idea. Um, it's not that it can't work, it's... It just looks like garbage, in my opinion, but again, to each their own. Um, okay. So, uh, so yeah, as far as that goes, I would expect, again, that we'd probably see more kind of audio consistency if characters are forced to, or if people actually voice all of their cutscenes. Um, we'll probably see more consistency of uh, kind of like character emotional reactions to stuff like we saw in Tor. Like, man, oh man, they really carried over the emotions of situations in this game. Um, when it comes to, uh, to potentially setting the mood uh, for all of these different areas, I would expect a huge amount of emphasis would probably go towards effects on maps. Um, I would expect a lot of uh, time to potentially be spent on those effects on maps. Um, I don't know that we'd see them being made bigger, but I'd love to see something like what Felseal did, of just having more interactable elements in there, and maybe a few skills to uh, to reference that. So, like, for example, for those that haven't played Felseal Arbiter's Mark, uh, it's an indie game that uh, uh, wanted to essentially bring back the classic FFT mechanics, um, and just kind of do more cool stuff with them. So you had cases where, like, let's say you could equip, a, uh, uh, equip skills on a class that allowed them to instantly climb a rope or instantly open a chest, uh, without ending their turn. Um, and, for example, you had some characters that would be able to interact with specific types of terrain, you know, kind of similar to your whole Geomancer type situation. Um, but this uh, this level of map interactability led to cases where you could have units that were built as just kind of movement specialists. Like, you could just build somebody as an infiltrator that could potentially, uh, you know, sneak past uh, the fight that's happening and lay a bunch of traps in the back row, and then you have your frontliners go and, let's say, bashing a bunch of units backwards into those traps, and it worked really well. Uh, or, let's say, you know, you set up a bunch of uh, traps beforehand because units specifically are scaling their damage based off how far they moved and stuff like that. So I'd expect expect to see a lot of those kinds of elements coming in, but I would not expect the skill point system to make a comeback, like I was saying earlier, because in general, it tends to get in the way of, um, of actually uh, having a narrative story like this, in my opinion. Again, something like uh, like the Rad Codex games, uh, so your uh, uh, Horizons Gate or your Kingsbane or stuff like that, um, it's a reason to keep exploring, because your fights are not just, you know, random grinding stuff, they cost you resources, and you have to actively seek them out, and so in those particular contexts, suddenly that experience is more valuable, the skill points are more valuable, and it creates a situation where it feels good to explore and, you know, give your people new experiences rather than just grinding.
because grinding, I think we can all agree, generally tends to suck pretty bad. So I would assume, I would assume that they'll probably have something similar to that emblem system uh, from Knight of Lotus there. I would really, really think that they would have some kind of mini achievement system there to let you still keep your multi-classing type of stuff, but let you unlock those skills a lot more intentionally so it feels like you're seeking them out, you know? Um, but at the same time, this ability to quickly regain your skills and uh, potentially remake units could allow for permadeath to play more of a part. Because, honestly, it it almost felt like an extra tacked-on feature uh, in that one, uh, in the original FFT. Because who, honestly, out there, outside of their first few playthroughs, actually let their units die? Because, like, I would imagine most folks out there would just immediately reload, because you are it's literally just time you're gaining. There's no additional drama gained. Um, there's very little reason to actually accept those deaths for most folks out there. Like, I'm, I'm usually a stubborn stickler for always sticking with permadeath and whatnot, and I've still had those cases where it's just like, you know what, I do not feel like making another character like this. I could hire a new, you know, white mage over there or whatever else, but, like, it's going to be the same unit. You know, I might have lost the unit with higher faith or whatnot, but for all intents and purposes, you know, for the purposes of completing this game, um, it's not necessarily going to change the equation any uh, for me to go and rebuild this unit. It's just going to take me additional time. Um, so even in that case, I, you know, just wasn't really feeling it. Um, so I would imagine that we'd probably see either the uh, uh, permadeath system go the way of the Dodo, which, again, the Rad Codex games did this too, uh, where they did not have uh, permadeath, but the fights were, pre uh, were fairly brutal. Um, so this kind of gave you a reason to keep exploring and building out your units, um, but it also gave, uh, still kept that kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, fear potential out of fights, as it were. So... Either way, I would expect that uh, we probably would still see the permadeath system. Uh, the only downside for when they did that in uh, in the Rad Codex games uh, was just that you'd have to reload, and typically there's been more of a focus uh, on that uh, mentality of game overs are a failure of game design and all that kind of thing, um, where that uh, if you're a ch like if you're getting a game over, it has to be a catastrophic end to your particular playthrough, um, and Again, even in cases like, let's say, in Tor's case, they actually did address that somewhat, um, where you've still ha you still have the option to retreat uh, from most fights um, if you're getting your ass kicked or if you are looking to, uh, to get a particular piece of equipment. Uh, maybe you didn't find what you were looking for in that map. Uh, they gave the scouting mode to know where you're fighting ahead of time, which actually, I would assume, uh, we'll probably see some of that as well, that you'll probably deploy units uh, in the map itself uh, rather than the party select screen uh, so that you can actually know what you're fighting. Um, since there was, I know there was definitely a big emphasis on strategy in Tor's case, I would assume in that case they'll probably also let you know what you're fighting ahead of time, um, and potentially give, uh, give you that, uh, permadeath system to potentially make people, uh, kind of, uh, spin around their builds more. Um, maybe you get insurance for a unit dying or something. I just feel like that, that feeling of loss is something that's very kind of part and parcel with the feeling of the game. I'm not sure taking it out would necessarily help much. It's like it, there's there's a it, it's a very jarring feeling uh, when uh, uh, when you have a character or when you have a game that's talking about the tragedies of war and whatnot, and then there's no death coming from your characters, you know. So I would assume that they'll probably end up keeping it. Um, uh, funnily enough, uh, uh, they actually kind of sidestepped this. So uh, I was talking about King's Vein earlier. Uh, where they're basically like, yeah, this entire place is made of clay, your people are basically clay people, um, and you're more or less just rebuilding your people every time they die. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, so yeah, as far as, um, uh, as far as permadeath, I would, ex I would assume that that would probably be there. I would assume it would probably be more prevalent, um, and additionally, I would assume, uh, that we'll probably see quicker ways to regain skills, rebuild units, all of that kind of thing. Um, so, Again, that, that would be my assumption on the whole thing. Um, I'd assume we'll also probably see more guarantees. Uh, one more th one more thing that we saw them lean into a lot uh, was a mechanic in Tor's case, uh, where there were a lot of skills that offered guarantees of certain things. Um, 
but they weren't necessarily utilized in the cleanest ways before. So like one of the things that they did was a kind of bottomed out uh, hit chance for things like debuffs. Um, and I would really expect them to bring back something like that, uh, where for example, if you use uh, something like concentration in this game, you will always have at minimum 30% odds to hit with your debuffs, um, even if for example, your stats are dramatically too low to make it land. I would assume we're probably going to see more stuff like that as far as just kind of general guarantees and such. Um, so that would be nice to see. Um, uh, but again, mostly the emblem thing. I really, 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 really want to see them do the emblem thing. Um, that's kind of the main thing that I just... Man, that, that would be mind-blowing if they did that, because that is one of the coolest mechanics that just has never been brought back for reasons that I completely don't understand because it's such a cool idea. Um, the closest thing uh, was uh, was probably something like XCOM 2. Um, and it's it, in its case, it's more that you got points from doing cool things and then you could spend them on a random selection of skills, but it wasn't quite the same, you know? Anyway, so that's all the time I had for today. Um, I gotta get going, so thank you all for stopping by. Uh, thank you for listening to this ramble here. Let me know what kind of theories you guys have, because I'm sure there's got to be a million of them out there. Anyway, I gotta get going. Y'all take care, and see you in the next one. Bye.